This is the floor channel. This is the floor channel. This is the floor channel. So welcome. Um, this is uh, going to be a side event on fossil fuel extraction from vulnerable areas. My name is Francesco. I'm uh, going to be moderating the session today, and I'm with uh, the Leave It in the Ground initiative. So when looking into opportunities to accelerate uh, towards the end of the fossil fuel age, we decided to look into the nexus of the climate and the biodiversity crisis and we analyzed the overlap of fossil fuels inside the world's protected areas and we found uh, a pretty heavy presence of the fossil fuel industry inside the world's most ecologically uh, sensitive places. And uh, this issue goes beyond just climate and, and biodiversity. Um, there are in many cases uh, people who are uh, affected by these, by these projects and uh, we are joined today by people who are representing the, the voices of communities who are or will be affected um, and who are currently living, breathing and suffering from the effects of fossil fuel extraction uh, in their lands. So to set the tone for, for the session, uh, these fossil fuels uh, must stay in the ground to uh, make space for real solutions for climate, biodiversity and people to thrive. So I'd like to now introduce our panel, um, Alice McGowan, who is the GIS specialist uh, with Lingo. Uh, she will talk about Lingo's analysis, some key numbers and key uh, takeaways from this. And we're also going to be exploring our map of fossil fuels in protected areas um, with you, with the audience. Um, we have Joseph Kenson Sakala, who is from the Youth for Sustainable Development Malawi and he will be talking about uh, the oil exploration inside Lake Malawi, which is one of the, most, uh, one of the biggest and most biodiverse lakes in, uh, in Africa. Uh, Shuma Duta from Pairvi uh, will be talking about uh, coal carbon bombs in, in Indian forests and the peoples that are affected by those, by those projects. We then have uh, Zasha muller Krenner from the Deutsche Umwelthilfe, and his organization has been um, opposing Wintersals Dea's presence in the Wadensee National Park, which is uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Germany. And lastly, uh, Kel Kuhne, who is the director of the Leave It in the Ground initiative. And he will be talking about the ultra-sour gas expansion project that is happening in the Marawa Marine Protected Area, uh, just uh, over 200 kilometers uh, from this very venue. And with that, Alice, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Um, I think we can start our presentation. Right. Uh, so this, I, my name is Alice McGowan, and I am a researcher and a project lead at the Leave It in the Ground initiative. And we are, I run a project where we are focused on mapping fossil fuels in protected areas. Um, you know, I, I want to start by just mentioning, you know, a lot of us think, protected areas, well, they're, they're protected. But in many cases, these areas are not protected from fossil fuels. So I like to structure my presentations around questions, and today we're going to look at four of them. Um, we're going to look at why focus on protected areas, why, why are they important. Um, I'll do a quick tour of how we arrived at our final statistics. We'll take a look at those statistics, those results, and then we'll talk about some next steps before I pass it on to my, um, my co-panelists for some actual um, looks of what that looks like on the ground. So 
we can see here an image from my home country, the U.S. Um, essentially, this was a coal rail car crash that was just left in the middle of a protected area. Um, and I think it's, it speaks volumes. Um, so why are we focused on protected areas? And by protected areas, we're talking about legally defined and determined protected areas that are on the IUCN's um, world database of protected areas. So we don't decide what area is a protected area or not. We're relying on individual countries to say, this area is important to us. And because of this, we find that protected areas are the best place to start creating non-extraction policies. As we start moving to a phase, uh, phase out of fossil fuel extraction, um, I think when the, the message around protected areas is that um, we should start here. This is, this is the place to start for um, non-extraction policy. Um, one, another reason for this is that um, these are frequently areas of biological importance, um, biodiversity importance, ecological importance, but then also cultural, historical, and in some cases religious importance. These are the treasures of each country um, that are worth protecting, especially as we look at the, the final days of the, uh, the final years, I guess, of the fossil fuel age. Um, and then because of all that, the impacts of extraction are often amplified. And what does that look like? Well, here we can take a look at um, a project in Yasuni National Park in Ecuador, the Brazilian rainforest, and then uh, again, back in my home country, the US, um, this is a, uh, another coal accident in the middle of a protected area. So coming up with, with figuring out how to track and really quantify the impacts of, um, of fossil fuel projects on a global scale, we started with three ingredients. Um, one was the industry's own data source for oil and gas projects, and that's the RISTAD database of oil and gas projects. We then, for coal, relied on the Global Energy Monitors database of coal projects, and then in turn, the IUCN, the International Union for, Con for the Conservation of Nature's database of protected areas, their world database of protected areas. We, oh, um, the first step, of course, was cleaning all this data up, deduplicating, um, label normalization, it was, uh, we used a piece of software called OpenRefine, um, which we then fed into our mapping software, which we used to identify projects in protected areas and summarize statistics. And those statistics kind of are, are lumped into two baskets, our per, our per protected area stats and our per country stats. And so this way we can look at the impacts per protected area in terms of CO, potential CO2 emissions um, from extraction in those areas, and then also look at that per country. So what are the results? Well, as you can see here, um, as we're looking at potential CO2 from extraction projects just in protected areas, and this is important to remember as we're looking at this graph, just in protected areas, we can see that a small collection of countries um, you know, are, are, are pretty much taking up three quarters of the, uh, of the potential CO2 emissions from extraction in protected areas. Um, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, the Russian Federation. Uh, Germany is quite interesting because it's actually just one project um, that puts them on the map. They have a large coal mine in the middle of a protected area that is responsible, that could be responsible for up to 2.4 megatons of CO2. 2.4 gigatons, yeah, gigatons, gigatons, yeah. <laughs> they're big numbers. Um, so oh, doing this, we, we built a map, um, and this is just kind of a quick look at our map. Um, we're gonna give you guys a link to, so that you can go online and view this map yourself. And immediately as we look at this map, we can see that this is not a global north problem, this is not a global south problem, this is truly a universal problem. Um, there's a large cluster, of course, in Europe, um, especially in the North Sea. Um, Australia down there in the corner is also not too far behind. And as you could see, um, 
over, um, there are a lot of blue dots. And those blue circles indicate projects that are, uh, sorry, a lot of blue, um, yellow, and orange dots. Now, these are interesting because this in, these are indicating projects that are still under initial licensing or development. So, and, and it's, it really illustrates a point that as many of the world's easy fossil fuel deposits are, are being used up, we are increasingly turning towards the protected areas, deposits there and, and reserves in those areas that have previously been off limits. And now that easy oil, gas, and coal is starting to, to run dry in many, for many countries, they're starting to go after their protected areas. So in total, we tracked 2,337, so 20, over 2,300 extraction projects in protected areas. Now this includes projects that are currently idled and of course projects that are still in development. Um, in fact, almost half of these projects, a little bit over half of these projects, are projects that are under development or in their initial licensing. Again, illustrating that um, we are looking at a, um, a ratcheting up of, of uh, these dangerous operations within the world's protected areas. So what does that mean for CO2, for actual potential CO2 emissions from these projects? Well, we're tracking almost 51 billion tons or gigatons of total potential CO2 from extraction in protected areas. Now, this is a rather amazing number. Um, the global output of CO2 from the world's protect, I mean, from the world in total last year was um, was around about this number. So that's that's a whole year of, of the world's emissions just in protected areas, just from projects that we're already on track um, to to extract in protected areas. Now. It's not just countries, of course. There's a lot of companies involved in doing this. Um, when looking at this list, we can see a lot of kind of the usual players here. Um, RWE Power is that German power company with that one mine. And this is amazing. This shows how devastating coal power is in terms of CO2 emissions. One project puts, one, one coal, pro coal mine in a protected area puts RWE Power and Usabelli Mine on the map. Um, meanwhile, it takes uh, the Venezuelan oil company, Total, Shell, and others, um, you know, hundreds of projects to, to be in the same leagues. So um, before I finish up, um, I just to say, so now we've looked at those numbers. We know how much we're extracting from protected areas or how much we're on track to extract from protected areas, but how much fossil fuel is actually under the world's protected areas. So we wanted to know both sides of the coin on this. Now to do this, of course, I'm a GIS specialist, so <laughs> had to make a map. Um, and what you're looking at here is a map of the world's fossil fuel deposits. Um, in orange, we can see oil and gas. In magenta, we can see coal. And the coal one's really interesting. We spent about a year just building a global coal map um, because we couldn't find one that was freely available. And so we know that we're on track to, um, to potentially emit, um, um, we know we're on track to potentially emit over 50 gigatons of CO2 from extraction projects already happening in protected areas. But if we were to to actually say that all of our protected areas in the world are off limits from extraction, well then we would be looking at over 250 gigatons of potential CO2 taken off the, the, the map <laughs> to, to be extracted. Um, and I think that would be, uh, that'd be pretty amazing. That's if we were to actually protect our protected areas. So um, in finishing up, um, the next step that we're looking for is um, to see if countries can pledge non-extraction in protected areas. Um, we can see that we're, you know, that we're looking at extracting over 50 billion tons 
um, but there's over 250 billion tons that, um, that can be taken off of the table in terms of extraction by making these, um, these pledges. Uh, I've mentioned uh, a few of the companies involved. There are obviously very many more. Uh, many of them are multinational and publicly traded companies, and um, we are looking to, to begin applying pressure in that regard. Um, part of the reasons we're here at COP and a large part of our work that we do here at Lingo is building alliances for non-extraction. We want to continue that. And then, of course, I want to invite everybody here to explore our maps and data. Um, you know, I've, I've given some overviews, but uh, it's actually all just one click away on our website. And I just want to leave everybody with kind of this one thought. Every one of these projects, every one of these 2,300 and 37 projects is an act of hypocrisy. You're protecting an area on one hand, and then with the other hand, destroying it. And it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense. Um, so I just want to, before I hand it off to Kel, um, I want to just, oh, not Kel, um, I want to invite everybody to explore our data and our maps. Um, you can grab that QR code there or you can just check out protected-carbon.org. Um, and of course, I wanna thank our partners, our data partners, FRAC, the FRAC Tracker Alliance, Oil Change International, and the German Postcode Lottery, which, um, which funded our project, so we need them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. And uh, we will now be giving the word to Joseph, who will be talking about uh, oil uh, exploration in Lake Malawi. Okay, um, thanks so much, um, Aris, for highlighting um, very important work, which I've um, been involved. My name is uh, Joseph Kenson Sakara, and I'm from Malawi. I'm working with uh, Youth for Environment and Sustainable Development, which uh, started as an environmental movement uh, when we were in the university and uh, now has grown to uh, working towards protecting the extraction of uh, fossil fuels uh, in the ground, with particular in Malawi. So just um, for some of you that maybe uh, don't know exactly where Malawi is. It's in the southern part of Africa, and uh, we are neighboring to Tanzania, Zambia, and Mozambique, as you can see in that map. And um, uh, of particular interest uh, in this map, um, it's the lake, which uh, you might see it forms a large part of our country. And uh, within uh, this lake, which is in blue, uh, there's been discoveries and exploration of uh, oil deposit, which uh, there's a very huge project to extract uh, the oil from the lake. Not only from the lake, but also there are also other oil blocks uh, upland. And uh, this is what I'm going to specifically focus on and just to give a picture uh, how things are. So uh, Lake Malawi, it's um, one of the largest lakes, freshwater lakes. Uh, it's the third largest freshwater lake in Africa, and uh, it has more than 1,000 fish species that are housed uh, in this lake. And also uh, in the southern part of the lake, it's uh, the UNESCO heritage site, which was uh, the first water-based heritage site to be declared. And um, there's also uh, a lot of tourism that is happening uh, along the lake, which also uh, generate revenue. So you can see that um, more than five million people in Malawi, as I'm talking today, depend on this lake, um, ranging from fish workers and also uh, other people that are uh, into fish business, uh, just to mention a few. And uh, just the lake itself, it provides almost 80% uh, of the fish supply in the country, which is a large source of protein, but also a large source of economic uh, livelihood especially for those people that live along the lake, uh, because this is what their life depends on. 
And uh, it also contributes through revenue uh, when you think in terms of uh, tourism and also the aviation uh, sector. So, um, there are a lot of uh, minerals, but uh, I'll focus more on the petroleum, uh, on the oil, because um, our target is to uh, stop the worsening uh, global uh, climate crisis, which Malawi has been one of the most severely affected countries with the increasing cyclones each and every year, with the latest cyclone Freddy, which uh, destroyed quite a large part of the country, in, uh, especially along the lake areas. So um, this is uh, one of the outlook from the government where they are uh, trying to uh, explore and uh, increase the investment in mining sector. And with these are uh, some of the uh, minerals where, which are being targeted. And um, previously we've been depending on agriculture as the main source of uh, our, our economy. And now the new government uh, is trying also to substitute agriculture with the mining sector because of the devastating impact of climate change on agriculture. And uh, you might see that um, so far there's been a lot of processes ongoing with regard to expanding the mining sector, ranging from the uh, licensing, which uh, as I'm speaking, it's an ongoing process, as well as uh, there's been exploration, which is also ongoing. Um, so far, there are six blocks that have been, um, that have been allocated uh, across the lake from the north and also uh, towards the south. And uh, the drilling itself, the good news is that has not yet started, but processes are ongoing which are leading towards, uh, towards there. So there are a lot of uh, challenges that, and pressure that now we are facing as a country uh, with the coming and growing appetite for uh, oil extraction. For example, with uh, uh, the divestment and expanding of the mining sector to substitute agriculture, uh, this has been uh, perceived as the best solution in the interest of the economy, but also at the same time the greatest threat uh, in the interest of the environment, but also the vulnerable people and majority of those communities that depend on this lake. Remember I said uh, more than five million people depend on the lake and also it's the largest supply of um, fish protein. And uh, there's been uh, expansion of this fossil investment to meet the economic needs, but without so much regard on the environmental uh, catastrophes that follows uh, there afterwards. So I wanted also to highlight that already, just when the topic of oil emerged in Malawi, there were already tensions between Malawi and Tanzania. And this has also been in the news. Uh, at some point, we are almost like preparing for war between these two countries because uh, on the Tanzanian side, uh, they are not of the view that this is a good idea because of the environmental damage that can be caused, not only on the biodiversity of the lake, but also on the livelihood of people that depend on the lake. So there's also uh, potential even conflict uh, raising over uh, the scramble for natural resources in Malawi which is already a tension right now, and this project might just even accelerate that further and even worsen. And uh, there's so much little consideration on the vulnerable communities that in the end, they pay the cost of whatsoever the damage. We've seen what has happened in Nigeria with the Niger uh, Delta Lever, and also we've seen also in uh, different other places, the communities paying the cost out of a uh, few people are making profits out of this extraction. So this is why um, I am here, because uh, the oil is not the only solution, the o it's not the only potential solution that Malawi has, but rather we also have other solutions that have, for some reason, deliberately not been emphasized. So this is why I want to raise uh, this voice and also to uh, urge different possibilities that we can push together for realistic solutions and not just minority solutions that only benefit the few. So my ask today uh, is to keep, to ask that this oil should be kept in the ground where they belong. And instead, let's invest in renewable energy, which is the proven to be the safe, uh, 
investment for all forms of life, but also we empower communities economically in Malawi. Because the challenge that we have is to address the economic needs uh, that the country is facing uh, currently. So just to give you uh, a picture that when we're looking at renewable energy, it's not like an option on the paper. But Malawi has the highest solar potential in the Southern African region, and also it has the highest wind potential. And the potential and the capacity that we can realize from investing in it does not only end up producing energy for few companies, but rather it will also empower communities to be able to uh, build businesses, small-scale businesses. Farmers will be able to do renewable um, energy irrigation using uh, investment in solar pumps, for example. So this is what we want to pioneer, that uh, energy in oil is not the solution to the problems that people are facing in Malawi. But rather, majority of the population, which 80% of our country, they are farmers, they will benefit largely from investment in renewable energy through uh, farming and also even making renewable energy accessible to the people. So this is what we are asking, instead of focusing on the fuel, which will worsen the already worse situation in my country. We are asking the world that they should support Malawi to invest rather in renewable energy. And those companies, we appreciate the money they have and would love this money to be invested in the right investment that will not only destroy the lives of people and nature, but rather promote the economic well-being of our people. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities that uh, can be realized uh, only if we can manage to turn the pathway, which would be very destructive if it's allowed to happen. So currently, there's an opportunity because the government of Malawi is reviewing the Petroleum Act, and uh, this will be passed in parliament. And before this is passed, we still have the opportunity to push and put pressure on government and also on those investors to rethink their investment and to consider investing in renewable energy, which, in my opinion, is the future for the economic growth of rural communities, but also the general economic development at large. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joseph, for sharing um, all of that. And I would now like to give the word to Shuma Duta, who is going to be talking uh, a little bit more about the, uh, the issues in forest areas in India. I will just be loading up the presentation, and we will get started. Thank you, uh, Francisco, and uh, good afternoon and namaskar. I'll be talking about, uh, I'll talk about the extraction of fossil fuels which goes on in large scale in India, uh, but not about all the projects. There are three areas, three uh, fossil fuel extraction project areas in India where the potential carbon emission goes beyond one gigaton, well beyond one gigaton. So I'll talk two up with, uh, about two of them where I've been working closely with the communities and the struggles but I'll focus on one to highlight how these extraction projects are not only <clears throat> adding to the carbon emission globally and for India's budget and the global carbon budget, but also how it is damaging the local communities because many international groups, even NGOs, civil society, have the uh, sort of way of saying that the global south needs more carbon budget without realizing that every ton of the carbon budget actually harms the communities that live in those ground, on the ground. So let me start by showing one of the protected areas. This is a, an, in India there are three levels of protection, national parks, reserve forest, and protected forest. Part of this is a reserve forest, part of this is a protected forest, and as you can see, this is a very rich forest. This is called Hasdewaran, it's in the eastern state of Chhattisgarh, and in India, Majority of the coal is concentrated in seven eastern states. Majority of coal reserves in India. So this is one of those states called Chhattisgarh. Northern Chhattisgarh has this Hasdewaran forest. This is something like uh, almost 1800 plus square kilometer. And if you look at this forest area, and one part where the mining has started, this has become like this. So you can understand Whatever was the biodiversity, what are the forest communities living there, 
In this forest, I'll come to that, roughly 70% of the income of the local communities used to come from the forest resources. And in India, during an earlier regime, some uh, 15, 16 years ago, there was a very progressive legislation, in short, which is called the Forest Rights Act, which gave the forest dwelling communities both community and individual rights over the forest land they have been living in for three generations or more. But all this destruction is going on by negating those rights, by violating the laws that the parliament has passed and notified. If you look at this and then what the forest actually contains in terms of biodiversity, like we are talking about protected forest, it's not just trees. There are hundreds and hundreds of species 82 species of birds, 167 varieties of vegetation, and there are many others which is not listed here. And surprisingly, or may not be surprisingly, the Indian government institution, Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education, has notified that this is the largest unfragmented forest in central India. Many of the forests have been fragmented, so the elephants and tigers and the large animals, they cannot really live there comfortably. But this is one of the largest this is the largest unfragmented stretch. And here, already the uh, mining permissions have been given. As I have shown, mining has started. And this is the kind of one block of this, out of the 23 blocks that it has been divided into, just one block where mining has started. And the second phase, roughly a quarter of a million trees will be felled. That's the government estimate. The local estimate is even more. And as I said, this is not just a question of trees or animals, which are extremely important, but the local communities. 10,000 was a, uh, 10,000 population was based on the, our earlier census in 2011. Now the population is higher. And they are completely dependent on these forest resources. The total coal reserve, there are two kinds of, and I'm showing this on the left-hand side, on the far side, you can see how good the forest was. On the right-hand side, you can see what it is becoming after the mining started. And again, one of the most infamous companies in India is very much involved in this forest. We are not allowed to speak about the companies and the nations, so we are just saying many of you must be knowing about it. But this, I'm not naming anyone. So this particular coal blocks, the total proven coal reserve is 1.37 billion tons. That means if it is entirely mined, the estimated carbon dioxide emission will be 2.8 billion tons, gigatons. So that's far above, far above one gigaton mark. Surprisingly, this is not in Alice's map, but this must come into the maps. So these are the kind of potential. And here, the good point is the local communities, the Adi, what we call Adivashis or indigenous people or tribal people, they are fighting against this mining. They are fighting to save the, save the forest, save the biodiversity, and save their own lives and livelihoods. And this struggle is very strong on the ground. Every march has been participated with thousands of local people, supported by groups like us. And this is going on uh, not only in the forest area, but this is also going on in the cities, in the capitals. And one very good point is this protest in the local area is led largely by two, if you call tribals, that is the indigenous people, Adivasis, and women, Adivasi women. In fact, women has taken the lead in most of these resistance struggles. And if you talk here about the abstract concepts of, uh, in the global stock take, how much is the carbon budget, 330 gigatons is left, how, to, how much to give to each country, these are all abstract concepts without any, something to hold on, intangible. And these are the people who are actually working to save the Paris Agreement goals, not the negotiators here. These are the people who are trying to actually save all biodiversity, trying to save the earth from going into the sixth mass extinction, which may be too late, I don't know. So these, without supporting these struggles on the ground, empty words here, without really putting tangible figures and facts on, the, on their hands, that's why very little progress goes on. And as I was saying, the particular, this Hasdeo Arend, Arend, uh, Arend coal blocks, these have a potential of over two gigatons of coal. I'll briefly talk about the other uh, mega uh, project, which is another carbon bomb. 
that I am in, uh, involved with for the last 12 years. That's in Singrauli. I am not showing this, I'm not focusing on this, but Singrauli is another major area where already 24 coal mines are operating and many others, and it's an entirely highly forested block in the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh where 24 coal mines are operating, 21 gigawatt of coal power plant are operating, and if you go there, if you work with these people, every fourth household of the villages suffers from some kind of ailment or the other, either a kidney failure or an eye problem or mercury pollution and neuro, uh, neurological problems. And these are the kind of impact that on the ground people have. Again, those who talk about carbon space for developing countries probably don't realize what people are paying, what price people are paying in the same developing countries because of this getting more carbon space, not development space, carbon space. This is, as I was saying, the lead in these struggles, the resistance, and to save not only Hasdeo for Oran Forest, not only Singrauli, but also the entire world's climate system is led by Adibashis, local tribal people, indigenous people, and women. This is one of the pictures with uh, Mahatma Gandhi's picture taking, and these are all non-violent struggles. None of these struggles have taken up a uh, stick or a sword or a knife to do any harm to the, uh, those who are really doing harm to the forest and their livelihood. These are all non-violent struggles. Lot of violence has been perpetrated by both the government and the goons hired by the company on these people. In spite of that, this non-violent struggle goes on. As I was also saying, most, if you go there, you'll see women are always on the lead in these struggles. And that's a good thing. And children are also taking part in this in very, very large numbers probably realizing their future because what the government and the companies, corporates are doing together is actually cutting off their future. So at the end, I'll say if we really want that whatever goes on here in these negotiations, whatever, if you really, if we all really want to have any possibility, any realistic possibility to save the world from a climate catastrophe, going beyond two degrees Celsius by the end of this, forget about 1.5 degrees Celsius, will any case cross that? By in the early next, next decade, will any case cross 1.5? All science shows to that. If we really want to keep well below two degrees Celsius, the only way we can do that is by strengthening, supporting, and standing in solidarity with all these struggles, so that despite the governments and corporate nexus to really destroy our world, we can save it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shuma, for that presentation and also for the, the final message. I think it's a, a really important one that has to be said in, in this context. We will now move on to Zasha, who will uh, talk about Vintasaldea uh, inside the Wadden Sea and more. Yes, uh, thank you for having me, and um, oh, here's the presentation. Well, um, thank you for having me, and uh, welcome here and online, and uh, I would l like to tell you the, the story about Wintersaldea, which is Germany's largest oil and gas company, a largely unknown company, and our campaign against their fossil business. And uh, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to give you some basic facts about the company. I wanted to tell you the story of their largest fossil pro uh, project in in the midst of a national park in Germany, about the legal action that we are taking and about some of their international business, in particular also here in the United Arab Emirates. So, who is Winter Saldea? It's uh, Germany's largest oil and gas company. It's important to know their main shareholder is Europe's largest chemical company, which is BASF. They hold two thirds of the shares. The last third is held by two Russian oligarchs. Which are now, who are now on the EU sanction list against Russia. And it's also important to know that those oligarchs have a part of the business. They got that in exchange to drilling rights to, of Wintersal in the Russian Arctic that have now been nationalized by the Russian state, so very bad business. Um, now, what uh, Wintersal is doing, they produce crude oil and natural gas in Germany and abroad. Uh, the largest chunk of their production is now in the Norwegian Arctic because the Russian government has been nationalized. It's still going on, but it's now owned by the Russian state government or handed over to Russian companies. 
but uh, uh, it's important to know that uh, Winter Saldea, as opposed to other companies, did not do that voluntarily, pulling out of Russia because that business was too important to them, but they, uh, their joint ventures were shut down by the Russian government as a counter sanction to European sanctions, so they lost all their business. So uh, what they also do, they have a number of offshore projects uh, that are very risky to the environment. They use fracking on land uh, in a lot of places, places like Argentina, for example. Uh, and uh, they also produce oil that threaten the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Sea National Park, and I'll tell you about that later. They, are, um, they uh, continue to invest in fossil uh, energy, over 150 million US dollars invested in the last two years in new fossil fuel projects, including projects in places like Argentina and here in uh, the Emirates. And uh, that is also important to know for the legal case that I will describe later. They are one of the only oil and gas companies that I know that have no non fossil fuel business. They only have oil and gas business. They have nothing else. They have no transformation plan. Their plan is to make money with fossils until the end of days. So uh, last but not least, um, uh, they are also a huge proponents of carbon capture and storage because this will be their way out under a carbon neutrality scenario. So this is what you see here is us protesting. I should be somewhere on that picture. And where am I standing? This slick. This is the Wadensee National Park. It's a unique landscape. It is the part of the German Atlantic that falls dry twice a day. It's a huge piece of land. It's a unique landscape on a, on a global scale. It doesn't look like that, but it, uh, it, uh, it hosts a tremendous biodiversity, in, in particularly for birds. It is one of their, uh, their places uh, to stay when they go from north to south. And what you see in the back is the oil platform. And uh, so this is a map, and you see this is the national park. This is one of the German states. And you see that in the midst of the national park, there, is, uh, uh, there are two uh, oil fields. And when the national park was created, an exemption was made for that oil development. It's exactly the same um, uh, uh, habitat and uh, the same biological conditions, but it was made sure that the national park was formed around existing oil development and which the company now plans to extend, but I'll get to that. So, Mittel Plata, that's the site of the project, uh, I already described that. In the midst of the national park, they produce 40%, uh, 40 million tons of oil per year. This is 5% of German consumption, and um, they plan to continue with that field until the end of 2041. And as I said, they want to extend the drilling to another area. And, uh, just to give you a picture here on how uh, uh, this park uh, looks. And uh, what we are talking about, as I said, it's an extremely sensitive area, so any oil spill would do tremendous challenge. We face that risk each and every day. It's not only the platform, it's the pipes, it's the ships, it's the whole operation. The more this is being extended to drilling fields farther away, the more pipes you will have and the larger the danger. Uh, for, for accidents, which would be disastrous, not only for the biodiversity here, but because of the bird uh, migration, it would be a disaster for biodiversity all over Europe and in Africa, because a, bird, a lot of birds migrate the Europe-African road, and they all stop here in the Wadden Sea, because it's such a rich feeding ground. So this is, this is a, a large uh, mess that we uh, would uh, face. Um, so what are we doing? Uh, we are... Um, we have two legal cases. We are planning legal action for next year against the company when they plan to extend their operations to a new oil field which would generate oil far into the 2060s and 70s. And let's remember, by the way, that Germany is supposed to be carbon neutral by 2045. This is international climate law. So how does that square with, uh, uh, with uh, drilling for oil until the 20? 2060. So uh, the planning permit for that extension is supposed to start next year. As part of that, there has to be an environmental impact assessment. This will be the legal angle for us to litigate. And I can promise you that we will win that case. The other thing that we are doing now, in fact, I'm doing that personally, 
uh, together with three other people. Well, I have sued with the backing of my organization. I have sued the company because it infringes of, on my legal rights to have a clean environment and a climate-friendly environment. Uh, this is a company that uh, contributes nearly 80 million metric tons of CO2 annually. So they are a major contributor to the problem. And uh, this is squarely not compatible with the decarbonization targets of the Paris Agreement. The company does have no decarbonization plan. Therefore, I have argued that they infringe on my constitutional rights. So we'll see where that goes. The court hearing was postponed last year. It's supposed to be next year, and this will be a landmark case whether I, as a German citizen, have a right against a company which significantly destroys my and my children's future. So we'll see about that, and maybe at one of the next COPs I'll report back on us having won those two cases. Um, now, lastly, uh, Wintersal, I said, it's a global company, and it's a company that is now rapidly expanding for a very simple reason. They have lost all their Russia business, the Russian uh, Russia, the Russian oil and gas fields were their biggest source of oil and gas, and they are also a trading company. They need new resources, so they start drilling like crazy everywhere. And including here in the United Arab Emirates, uh, in Maragua, this is two hours from here. This is a UNESCO bios biosphere reserve, home of some of the last dugongs in the Arab Gulf. And, uh, well, um, this is a scandal in itself. But another thing we're paying attention to now is that, uh, that uh, BASF is, uh, is trying to sell Winter Saldea for the simple reason that this messes with their carbon budget and they also need the money for, uh, for in other investments they want to make. And some of the candidates are uh, Equinor, which is a Norwegian company, uh, Total Energies, which is the large French oil and gas company, and Adnoc from here. So let's see where that goes. We have written to BASF and to all the investors and all the shareholders of BASF that, they do, that we do not want them to sell Wintersal to someone else who continues the fossil business. We want them to wind down Wintersal's fossil business and transform it into a sustainable business, and this is the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zasha, and best of luck with the court case, which I am sure you will win also. And um, yeah, so we've gone a little bit around uh, the world looking at individual projects, and now uh, we'd like to uh, come back to here, and Kjell is going to be talking about the um, expansion project that is happening in the, in the Marwa Biosphere Reserve in the country. So again, I will be loading up the presentation and we can get started. Thank you, Francesco. Yeah, so based on the analysis that Alice has described, where we looked at the global picture of fossil fuels inside protected areas and where we found hundreds and hundreds of such examples, um, we have now a large database and uh, we'll have a look at that uh, after my presentation. And uh, when we were invited to come to uh, Dubai for COP28, we thought, okay, let's have a look what's happening in the UAE, because it's uh, such a global problem with 90 countries being affected. We want to know what the COP host is doing and what the situation is here. And what we found was quite frightening because the largest marine protected area in the Arabian or Persian Gulf, the Marawa Marine Biosphere Reserve, is being threatened by a huge fossil gas project as we speak. So just eight weeks ago, the company led by Dr. Sultan Al-Jaber signed a, what they call a mega project, the Rasha Heil mega project, the biggest offshore sour gas project in the world uh, to be done partly inside the UNESCO biosphere reserve of Marawa. And that is happening at the same time as leading negotiations about how to solve the problem. So that seems to be a huge con contradiction. And uh, to give you some background on the reserve itself, it has been protected under UAE law uh, for many years, and it was proposed 
as one of the new natural wonders of the world due to Butina Island being very unique with mangroves, with corals, um, with uh, seagrass meadows, and those seagrass meadows sustain uh, one of the densest population of uh, dugongs, the sea cows that I will show you a picture in a second. There you have it, the dugong with its yellow fish friends. Um, the dugong is at the root of the myth of mermaids, and these animals are quite unique. They're very uh, soft and uh, shy, and they eat seagrass all day long. And uh, one of the densest dugong populations in the world lives in the Marawa Biosphere Reserve. And so it's a very unique place. Uh, it does not have only dugongs. There are also dolphins, turtles, and other uh, species on the red list. And the coral reefs inside Marawa are also unique because the Persian Gulf has seen very hot conditions in the geological past. And these uh, corals have adapted to that and survived that. So there is a potential that these particular corals that are here in the Gulf may survive the climate emergency and help us repopulate other areas around the world. So the status of Marawa as a protected area is very well deserved and it was the first uh, biosphere reserve recognized by UNESCO in the country. Here's the dugong uh, munching away at its seagrass. And so now let's talk about the threat from the fossil gas industry. Um, in order to get to the gas, uh, they will have to drill wells. Uh, they're planning to drill those wells on artificial islands, which are huge structures. Uh, the other day we showed images and uh, numbers that these artificial islands are constructions that are bigger than the Burj Khalifa, the, the tallest building in the world. Um, so these are really huge things being built in the middle of the, of the reserve, and that takes a lot of dredging that creates uh, uh, you know, sediment in the water which will settle on the seagrass, on the uh, corals, and uh, may kill them off. There's also, of course, a lot more traffic going through in order to, to uh, build these and maintain these infrastructures, and uh, collisions with boats have been named by the UAE authorities as one of the leading causes of death of dugongs in the past years. Um, there's always the danger of oil spills and gas leaks whenever you build uh, uh, extraction infrastructure. Uh, the industry tends to characterize this as accidental, but uh, if you look at any project, you will find that this is part of what is happening in any project. And uh, one thing that is particularly concerning is that uh, there is not much information about the particular kind of gas, and I'll get to that in a, in a minute, which is sour gas. When that leaks into the environment and is very toxic, we don't really know what, what, what the dangers are. We know it kills fish, but what the exact impacts are, we don't know. So an environmental impact assessment is badly needed, and that's the standard uh, for any big project. And it has been done, supposedly, but nobody knows for sure because it has not been made public. So there is nothing in the public domain uh, to tell you about the impacts of these projects and uh, to know what's, uh, what's going to happen there. And uh, just to give you an idea on the map, you can see here the green area, that's the reserve. And around it, there is a lot of oil and gas infrastructure already. So we have here mapped uh, oil and gas platforms, uh, pipelines. I think these are only the major pipelines and shipping channels. So there is a lot of industrial infrastructure around the reserve. And in theory, this would be an island of protection within this very much uh, impacted space in the uh, UAE offshore. But now this project is going to uh, go into that reserve and build a lot more infrastructure inside it. So that's what we have found while looking, zooming in onto uh, this one example out of 900 uh, of a protected area uh, in, in, the, in the host country just down the coast from here. Now what's the fossil gas project about? It's called the Rasha Heil Mega Project. It is part of a fossil gas expansion that our host country is undertaking. Um, the, one of the issues is that right now a lot of fossil gas is being imported from Qatar 
and the contracts will run out in the early 2030s and the idea is to replace that with domestic fossil gas but not just that uh, it's also for export so it, it's a big expansion that includes exporting the gas itself as LNG it includes exporting hydrogen made from fossil gas uh, produced by by burning fossil gas and it also includes taking the gas to inject it into the oil fields to extract more oil and uh, be able to extract five million barrels of oil per day, uh, which is the declared goal of, uh, of the country. So um, this big expansion strategy uh, needs places to get all that gas from and uh, so they don't shy away from the uh, unique protected area. The lifetime emissions of just the Rasha field, which is one part of the mega project, is almost half a gigaton of CO2 over its life cycle. And it has been declared by the company that this will be the first net zero uh, project in the world. And uh, when they say that, they don't mean uh, actually burning the gas, they just mean getting it out of the ground and they will account for the emissions and uh, you know quantify how much uh, is emitted by that and they will try to electrify and they will try to pump it underground with CCS um, and uh, you know use different ways to uh, make the project seem greener but they're not accounting the scope 3 emissions which means the emissions when you actually burn the fossil gas which is as we all know the main uh, you know, end situation with, with fossil fuel projects. This ultra sour gas is very corrosive, very toxic, it corrodes the pipes, it's technically challenging, it's expensive and uh, this company going after a big sour gas deposit um, is an indicator that the sweet gas, the high quality gas is already running out so now they're going for the more toxic stuff. Um, as I said, this is a, uh, has been signed, uh, the final investment decision has been signed just a few weeks ago uh, for almost 17 billion US dollars. The concession lifetime is 40 years and out of 11 artificial islands that have already been built, nine are inside the Marawa Biosphere Reserve and its transition zone. And the drilling has not yet started and that's why we are here mentioning it sharing about it because we think that if the UAE continues to aspire to a sort of leadership role in certain spaces, um, this is something that should not be done. And two years from now, the World Conservation Congress of the IUCN will be held in Abu Dhabi. So there is uh, you know, a continued interest of the world in looking at what the country is doing. And uh, so we think that this should not go forward. Now, the questions this project raises is about compatibility with IUCN policies. Um, IUCN has recommended that governments prohibit infrastructures inside all protected areas and that businesses such as ADNOC respect those protected areas as no-go zones. And as you can easily count one on one together, that's not happening in this case. There are standards recommended by the IUCN about transparency such as disclosing environmental impact assessments which has also not been uh, respected in this case and lastly there is an IUCN policy also about fossil fuel phase out um, which should not be delayed which should include oil and gas and where CCS uh, as is being used in this project as an excuse to say this is you know environmentally friendly and this is uh, progressive um, according to the IUCN policy this should not be used to delay the phase out um, of all fossil fuels and why am I talking about IUCN uh, policies here because on the COP team there is the COP28 high-level champion Razan Al Mubarak who is also the IUCN president and uh, we believe that Razan would have all the reasons to advocate for the adher adherence to IUCN standard. She is, by the way, also a champion of dugong conservation. You can see her here on her personal website with a dugong statue. And the UAE has been leading on conservation efforts for dugongs. They're the host of the dugong MOU, which is the most important dugong conservation effort globally. So we think that uh, with these 
policies, with these guidelines, uh, with the international conservation community in the back, it would be good if Ms. Al Mubarak stood up to the fossil fuel industry and defended the Marawa Biosphere Reserve against more fossil gas drilling. So that is the situation with the Marawa Biosphere Reserve. One example out of 900, as I said, it raises questions about the UAE leadership role and you know who wins if there is a conflict between biodiversity and fossil fuel extraction. And uh, we have invited uh, a Dugong envoy to COP uh, to raise these issues. Our demands are to stop drilling inside the Marawa Biosphere Reserve, to publish the environmental impact assessment, and for the foreign partners who are involved with this, there is a number of companies from Italy, from Germany, Vintasaldia is one, as Sasha mentioned, from Austria, Russia, uh, Japan, South Korea, Samsung, you see it there. Um, all these companies are part of that project in one way or, or another, and we call upon these companies to stop their collaboration until the protection of the Marawa Biosphere Reserve is actually respected. And uh, we have a Dugong envoy here at COP who is uh, speaking every day at 1 p.m. in the building B1 and inviting COP delegates to take sides with the Dugong against more fossil fuels and building a coalition called the Friends of the, Fos of the Dugong. So um, that is how we're raising this issue here. And uh, I'm glad to see uh, uh, a number of colleagues here in the room and I hope we will be able to carry this message out there and uh, build the, uh, the ground level of support uh, for protection of protected areas. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kiel, and thank you uh, very much to the rest of the panel for uh, sharing these examples. As we were saying, these are um, you know, some examples on a extremely uh, wide range of places, of countries. And uh, before we move on to the Q&A, um, I would like to uh, ask my colleague Alice to uh, share live with you, the audience, um, what this map looks like, how it can be used, um, and just show you a few examples of some, uh, some countries and focusing in on the projects. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as you may have noticed, uh, some colleagues of ours have been moving through the room asking people, where are you from? And that is with good reason. Um, and so I wanted to just use some of these countries um, as examples that we can um, move in and take a look. This is, you look at the map. Um, this is the live map. Um, it's, um, it's rather jumbled. So let's, let's take some closer looks for just a few minutes. Uh, I see we have somebody from England, and the UK is one of the most prolific um, um, creators of projects in protected areas, mostly along the North Sea. Um, as you can see here, these large blocks are impacted protected areas. And we can take a look, Dodger Bank. Um, just from this one protected area, we're looking at uh, about 54 and a half megatons of potential CO2 from identified operations. Um, again, I'm just going to call attention to our color coding right here. Um, luckily, they're not a lot of coal projects, so we don't have to worry too much about that. But for oil and gas projects, we can see them identified, um, labeled by what kind of area they're in. Um, we see idols, which, as we know, when oil prices jump up, a lot of idled or what they call abandoned um, projects suddenly become unabandoned, and so we definitely include them on our list. Um, initial licensing and surveying means that they have begun the initial phases of developing a project. Um, we can see a lot of those blue and yellow dots on here, indicating projects that are still in the early development stages. Um, under development means that actual commercial extraction equipment is getting moved in and they are getting geared up to begin commercial extraction. 
And then, of course, our red dots, um, some of them are hidden under here, are, um, are currently producing assets or projects. So, and again, one can view this by going to the protected-carbon.org, protected -car protected um, and you can browse around and take a look yourself. So, see another protected area. 57.8 gigatons. So this is just the North Sea. Um, let's jump across the Atlantic um, and we will take a look at Mexico. So here in Mexico, we can see some clusters. Um, we can, right here is a coal plant, a currently operating coal plant. Coal mine, coal mine, very important, thank you. <laughs> um, that is on track to generate 190 um, tons of potential CO2 emissions. Megatons. 100, yeah, 190 million tons. Looking a little bit south, Venezuela has a huge amount of production resources. We can see some um, in development resources here, I mean projects here, but there's a huge amount of in develop of under production ones. And for these protected areas, we've actually color coded them as well, um, going from light extraction, well, light <laughs> um, extract, you know, regu regular, well, I don't know, there's no regular level of extraction, but uh, all the way up to gigaton or 1,000 million ton um, extraction projects. And we can just see clusters of these projects here. Oops. So this protected area is, is looking to have one, almost one and a half gigatons of CO2 emitted from the resources within it. Let's take a look at our list. Um, let's see. I see China, um, we have some colleagues from China. Let's jump back across. Actually, wait, we also have Gabon. Um, right here we can see that a lot of their resources and extraction projects in protected areas are, whoops, oh, whoa. <laughs> clustered around the, uh, the, the edge right here. And that I would not like to be a fish or, or an aquatic animal or plants living, living here in this reserve. One of the interesting things about our, well, okay, I'm turning it again. One of the interesting things about our map is that uh, we, list, um, we list the managing authority for a lot of these, uh, these areas, which uh, might be quite interesting to a lot of people who is actually in charge. Okay. Yes, we'll make our way over to China. Now with China we see scattered resources um, there, but one thing um, you'll notice is that all the oil and gas projects, we have uh, circles and coal projects are squares. And there's, uh, there's a few squares here. We can zoom in on this one, prod, this one set of projects right here in the northwest of China and see that we are looking at a gigaton level of extraction. Um, yeah, 1.4 billion tons of potential CO2 from, um, from the projects there. Um, I'll do, I guess I'll do one more. Um, let's jump to Italy. If we haven't done that continent. And again, looking at Europe, it's quite remarkable for, um, for the, especially in the, for a block like the European Union that has put a tremendous amount of, um, um, attention on on the um, the transition, the green transition. We see just a huge 
a number of projects spread across. And of course, Italy is no different. Oh, I'm rotating our map again. Oh, yeah, that's going to make me dizzy. <laughs> OK, well, um, yes, as we can see here, there are projects spread throughout the country. Um, an interesting thing is to see um, some of the idled projects that are spread throughout as well. And we do um, definitely keep track of those idle products, projects because, as I mentioned, um, as, as oil and gas prices change, uh, a lot of those idle projects are quite often in danger of springing back to life. And um, yeah, and again, um, you can find this at protected-carbon.org. Uh, it is a great resource for finding um, protected areas that are impacted near you or near er areas that you care about. And um, of course, my colleagues at Lingo and I uh, would love to speak with anybody about um, um, how we can help support, um, support any struggles in, in better protecting these protected areas. Because once again, um, protected, as we can see just looking at this map, protected areas are not protected from fossil fuel extraction. So, thank you. Thank you, Alice, for uh, sharing this, uh, this map. And uh, if I can add just one thing before moving on to the Q&A. Um, we do not have the, uh, the company data that we were showing earlier uh, available on this map, but this is something that we, we do have. And uh, we do encourage uh, people who are facing uh, these situations and would like to, um, you know, push for non-extraction in protected areas to, to reach out to us um, about this, uh, about more details on this data. So anyway, now um, I'd like to open uh, the floor to some questions from the audience. Um, if you, yes? So there's, sorry, yeah, there should be a microphone coming your way. Thank you very much. Sorry, we sprung that one on you. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Uzmi. I'm a journalist from India. So basically a question for all of you. What are your expectations on the fossil fuel, which is a very contentious issue on the ongoing negotiations? What are your expectations from COP on this issue? Thank you. Do you want right. to? Okay, see, the expectations are based on what the countries have taken a stand because we saying something or showing something is immediate, not going to change them immediately. Some of the countries have publicly stated, including my own country government, when I'm saying countries, it's not the countries, it's the governments. It's not people who are speaking, it's the governments. They have publicly stated that any text of fossil fuel phase out entirety without this unabated qualification, they will oppose. So publicly stated, China has publicly stated so obviously, given the UN position that it has to be unanimous, any country putting a strong objection, it cannot go into the text. Uh, personally, I don't see that at least this COP, they will take a stand on fossil fuel phase out as a whole. What the Secretary General is also saying, not abated, not reduction, phase out of fossil fuels. That we don't see coming from this COP at least. See, repercussions right now, in, in our own country, your, in your country, the southern state of Tamil Nadu is being devastated. The fourth biggest metropolitan city, Chennai, is underwater and billions of dollars of loss. In Himachal Pradesh, I'm just taking our country. Himachal Pradesh, in the month of July and August, it was devastated because it was a very unusual monsoon and heavy rainfall and flooding and landslides. So 374 lives lost and more than $2 billion damage. Tista, Sikkim, you know the damages. So these are continuing throughout the world. And if the governments, because the parties here are the governments, they are not willing to listen and really uh, take into cognizance and act. I think the last resort for people will be uprisings. There's no other way. Just talking probably will not be doing. Okay, maybe just to compliment on what he said. Um, We've seen in recent years that um, as a global community, we've been able to come together and confront the critical global challenges like uh, 
the health crisis we've had and a number of issues. So my expectation is that um, there's a very significant potential in renewable energy, which is not just theoretical, but has been proven to be um, a very workable and practical solution. And in the same spirit, um, my expectation is that um, we've seen the worsening situation across different parts of the world, and that we can also come together in the same spirit and energy that we've been able to confront other emerging global challenges to champion renewable energy as the, the safest pathway to invest in the energy demand, in the growing energy demand, but also at the same time to alleviate the economic poverty that uh, the energy nexus comes in with. So my expectation is that we should be able to realistically look at the energy pathway and uh, choose the type of energy that is not just convenient for our economic needs, but which is more sustainable for both uh, the present and also the future generation. So I expect that um, we should not just uh, discuss like sidelines, but we should face this reality and uh, uh, agree as a global community that I think this is the way to go and we need to commit towards that direction. Thank you, Thank you Joseph. Um, next question, please. He was raising his hand. Thank you so much. Uh, I am Friday Bani Barile. I coordinate Lake Development Foundation in the local community in Logoni, Niger Delta region of Nigeria. The world Lake is a local language that means a comfortable environment. So we try to promote and advocate for a clean and healthy environment that will be suitable for human beings to live. Yeah, uh, I'm so happy for this opportunity, but uh, my question border on the impact of fossil fuel in my community where I live. And when I see some of the uh, fight and example you uh, put in place, I'm so excited, especially uh, what uh, uh, Sa Sasha was talking about. Uh, you may do mention about uh, Sorry, one minute. You do mention about uh, filing a court ruling case to force company radical reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission. Uh, and you also talk about uh, a minor spay, oil spay in the region. In my own case, in my own community, it's not minus. Even to now that I'm speaking to you, there is oil spay ongoing in the community. And because the government of Nigeria and the, the multinational oil company are in collaboration together, they give a deaf year. <laughs> Nobody talk about it. <coughs> so they consider it like, like human beings not living in this part of the, the, the country. And the, the impact, the negative impact in the local community, the poverty impact being the finance in the, in the city, Abuja, where those big men sit down and be enjoying as I'm speaking to you, we have about, uh, only in the Niger Delta uh, region, that is about uh, 31 million population of Niger Delta. Nigeria is about 200 million population. That Niger Delta have about 171 uh, gas plant site. And so uncountable, about 400 oil spill uh, where, oil where uh, site. And the farmers, they don't have a voice again. The fishermen don't have a voice again. When I see the data you were showing, I was looking at Nigeria, but I, didn't, I could not find Nigeria also. And this information I've not been passing to the International Committee for Solidarity Action. Ever since the killing of Ken Saramiwa and others, this agitation, the, the share in particular, they, they, are, they are very, I don't know, they're very creative, very creative. They have to find a way to lobby maybe one of the prominent elder person or stakeholder in the community. And when, when once they get one or two persons like that, they give a deaf ear. And it becomes a communal crisis because some of the youth rise up and speak against your fellow community chief. Before you know, they burn down the chief house. It results to another communal crisis again and again. And it keeps occurring. And this matter is not brought to the internal community where people can give more attention and find a radical solution to this issue that we are passing through. Last year, we, that was my first year in COP. We left COP 27, just get home in, in my own country. And I, I see a report that uh, Nigeria, for instance, under D, uh, about 125 billion 
uh, uh, gas plant that will tra transport uh, plant gas from Nigeria up to Morocco. That was why they launched the Don Gas Africa campaign. If you keep that one aside, recently, on the 7th of this month, here in this conference, this call we are, we are having, our president was here. He also signed a deal about $5 billion, uh, we share. And we are going home. Though during this campaign, he said that, yes, uh, if you people vote me, I'm going to bring more uh, fossil fuel, coal mining will come up again. If you people vote me, I'm going to bring more uh, development on oil, oil uh, production. And that was the, the manifesto you gave to us. This issue continually happened, but I don't mind the Abuja people. I'm talking about my community, where I stay, where I live. The life expectancies of this region have reduced drastically to 41 years. So if you are 41 years, consider yourself one of the elder persons in that community. It's one of the most polluted communities on the planet. I'm not the one saying This is what research I brought to the table. There was a time before COVID-19, everybody had to use nose masks because of blood suit, a tiny, tiny particular matter that come up from gas flaring day by day. It was one of the governors of River State, then Yenzo Mike, that came up fully and brought all his own power, used his own office, and stopped those uh, 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 coal fire, we call it coal fire in the region, and some of the OSP, and it was a bit reduced. This is not scientifically reduced, but physically. Because at that time, if you bring your finger to your nostril like this, bring it out, you see a tiny, tiny blood particle. Mm -hmm. If you wake up in the morning, use your hand, top on your, just touch on, on your vehicle. You see, all your, your palm, you see a tiny, tiny blast suit part, uh, particle. And people keep living in that area. I will share a story on impact of health in regard to that. Because I'm also a health pr uh, uh, practitioner. You see some cases in the hospital that a young girl is no longer seeing their period again, person of 35 years, you see, um, age of many, many, many parts. This is crazy, and we need collaboration. We need solution. Now, I see just a tiny oil in your region. You are suing them for a gas, a gas, greenhouse gas emission. What about people who the continuation of OSP in the land, and nobody speak? If you talk, they are ready to bring police because they have security. When, in fact, there are a lot of security that secure their facilities. These facilities have been on the ground for over 60 years because since 1956 and 58, when they came to fully operational fully in the community, ever since then, they have, ne they have never changed the pipeline, the underground pipeline that they did. And this thing is rough. Uh, excuse me, Freddie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there, was there a question also following that or? Yeah, yeah. My, my, my question was uh, what can we do in collaboration, especially from the, the, the to take action, to take action for this yeah. emergency, this case that is, is demand action. What can we do to just now plan an action and begin an action on the table? That was my question. Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much for, for telling that story. And actually, uh, I have uh, uh, a number of things that I would like to do. and. As I have to run out in five minutes, I will leave you my card when on my way out because I would love you to cont contact me to do something together. And uh, firstly, um, the most important thing that comes to my mind is uh, that um, um, uh, we um, now, since we have this uh, this energy crisis, and the Russians cut down all the gas supply to Germany. Well, our government has been traveling around the world and telling everyone we buy all your gas at every price including to Nigeria. So G German Chancellor Olaf Scholz just some weeks ago was in Nigeria and met your president and signed a deal um, uh, on, uh, on sending uh, LNG gas from Nigeria to Germany. So what I'm always telling, and yesterday we had a meeting with communities from Texas in the US, what I'm always telling people in Germany, in our government, in our parliament, this is not gas that we buy somewhere on the world market. It's gas that we buy from real places, with real people, with a real impact on the climate, on biodiversity, and on people's health. So, and I want people to understand what they do when they pay for that gas, that that has an impact on, uh, on real people so that we have a responsibility. So, 
and uh, we've, uh, we've tried to do that with the main sources of gas, with other gas deals, uh, with uh, fracking gas coming from the US, with uh, a current project in Senegal. And now that I read, and sometimes I just learn from the newspaper, you know, I watch open evening news, and I see my chancellor next to your president, and I see that he announces a gas deal. And my first thinking is, well, tomorrow I have to probably issue a press release, but I don't know very little. Therefore, we need people that uh, know the situation in the country. So I'll leave you my info, and then let's stay in touch uh, on, on that. So this is the one thing we can do. There are two other things, and I'll be a little bit shorter. Um, um, the first one is, uh, and this is one of the main issues that I and my organization want to achieve here. So uh, uh, we need to stop fu funding, financing for new fossil projects. And in particular, not from government sources. Because, well, a private company, what can I do? Not much. I can appeal to their conscience and maybe to their sense of business. Uh, but with my government, it's, uh, I elect the government. It's my taxes. I don't want my taxes to be spent on new fossil projects, not in Germany, not in other places. And that goes for export credits, and that goes for guarantees, and all those things. And uh, this is a huge fight, because this is a very profitable business, also for the banks that do it. This is the second thing, and uh, I have been telling people from other countries here, and including yesterday to the US, well, you have to tell the German government that this is not acceptable anymore. And the third thing is, um, uh, well, um, where, um, where we can do something, and uh, this, is, um, um, this goes back to what I presented before, this is less about the Nigerian case, but, uh, but about others. In a case like Wintersall there, the one thing is we can litigate against concrete project, but there's another thing. Uh, the, each company ha now has the legal requirement to publish corporate responsibility reports in the European Union. And well, those uh, reports can be shallow and superficial, but what they are not allowed is to lie. And so this is, now we're doing research on companies' report. What are they saying and are they telling the truth? Because if they don't, then they are liable, and then we will sue them. And this is exactly those things. You normally, in those reports, uh, you get pictures of those projects. Those are always lovely pictures, with people dressed in local dresses and singing songs and things like that. But what you do not see is the blood on the finger. Therefore, this is what we do. In the case of uh, the, the gas deal with Nigeria that uh, was recently published, as far as we've done the research, this has been there is no German company involved in the drilling, but it's an existing project. It's just a trading company that is doing it. So we have to find about that, whether we have any leverage there. I'm not sure yet. We have to find out, but those may be about the action points. Thank you, Sasha. So I believe we had a question as well from David. Yeah. Uh, keeping in mind that we just have a few minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, David from NRGI, and it's my question to Sacha. You brief question because very, I actually yeah, have yeah. to go. Okay. Well, I can email otherwise. It, you you were proposing to BSF about uh, winding down Winterschau, and I was wondering, had you proposed a way of winding it down and transforming it into another business? You know, um, it's very simple, and I actually talked to the CEO who looked at me totally aghast. Um, well. It's, it's an energy company. They can also sell renewable energy. I do not want them to end their fossil business tomorrow. I understand this does not work. There are people working there, there are shareholders, their jobs are to be, be preserved, but they want them to make a plan. Germany has submitted legally to be carbon neutral by 2045. I want each German company to be carbon neutral by 2045 which means you have to start now. And I want them to have a plan. They should sh wind down their fossil business, not overnight, but over the next 22 years. And that they, sh they should replace it by something else. I do not mind Wintersaldea being a profitable business. I do not mind the shareholders making money. I just don't want them to make money with dirty coal and uh, oil and gas. That's it. <laughs>
was a lie. <laughs> All right. So we gotta we gotta wrap up. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sasha. Round of applause, please. Thank you. All right. Do we have time for one more question, or is it over? No. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, thank you very much uh, to the audience. Thank you very much to all of the members of the panel. It was really uh, fascinating to hear uh, all, of the, all of the stories. And uh, yeah, once again, thanks for being here.